Good morning. This is a lecture about the French colonization of North America, their motives and their desires and their designs. This is your Nathan Giesensaw, your professor. The French, after the French efforts at colonization in North America, very differently from that of the Spanish and of the English. The Spanish here for God, gold, and glory in some form or fashion. The English, to, especially in the early days, to dump the malcontents uh, whom they could not stand, uh, whether they were religious eccentrics or political dissidents or just simply uh, the Scotsmen that they don't like. Uh, and to do that dumping as cheaply as possible, that was the British designs. But for the French, their design and desire to colonize North America was for a different purpose. The French purpose is not for the conversion of souls uh, of the Indians, uh, which you find in the God part of the Spanish activities, uh, especially in places like Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, San Antonio, Texas, uh, East Texas, and elsewhere with the Mission Presidio complex. But these French, however, having no real uh, recourse and, and finding of gold uh, in their part of Canada, are also going to look uh, to establish trade relations with the Indians in their general geographic areas. Uh, that, and so ultimately, if you're asked the question, what are the French up to? It is trade, and trade with the Indians, and the Indians especially. The French are looking for beaver pelts. They were looking for fur pelt uh, to uh, trade uh, from the get from the Indians in exchange for beads, uh, gunpowder, firearms, and various other European products uh, that the Indians find desirable. In fact, actually, uh, to give you an idea how big uh, this is for the Indians uh, with regard to uh, these European products, uh, when we have the French and Indian War in the 1750s and 60s, you're going to see a good number of uh, Indians, or Native Americans if you like, uh, they are going to be wearing French and other European fashions uh, while they're in battle. Not all, and some will stay in their traditional uh, cultural garb, uh, but others will be uh, dressed as a European, uh, seemingly indistinguishable uh, from their European, perhaps, enemies. Uh, but anyways, uh, so that was the des Indian desire, and the French, uh, they are seeking beaver pelts. Uh, two examples that I often use and will use here uh, to demonstrate how important to the French the the, the beaver is, especially the beaver pelt, uh, is can be found on, say, one, the flag of Oregon, the state of Oregon. The back of the flag of Oregon is a, has a beaver on it. You put a beaver on a flag, that's pretty big stuff. In addition to that, the Great Seal of Canada on it has a beaver, and that should demonstrate in a just a symbolic way how much beaver mattered to the French and what they are up to and what they want. So all that good and glorious trade, that's what they seek. Uh, so you're not going to ever see the French uh, lay down settlements uh, like the Spanish and especially the English. The French never send massive numbers of settlers, uh, it, or whether they're malcontents or not, uh, they never send massive numbers of settlers into these French colonies that they're going to set up in what we'll call New France. Most of the men, especially early on, are going to be those traders, and they're going to be single men, and with some uh, missionary Jesuits uh, who would be found in Canada. So there is a little bit of conversion, but it's mostly the trade that uh, interests us in an American survey class. The French uh, legacy in North America will be important beyond just fur trading. Uh, one of the legacies the French are going to leave behind is their, uh, their naming legacy. If you travel through the upper Midwest, uh, and especially through the Great Lakes and old Rust Belt regions, you will find in Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, and beyond, you'll find many streams, rivers, towns, and lakes who are named for French, uh, uh, French surnames, French people, French places, and so forth. You cannot help but see that. Uh, the stuff that ha comes in Louisiana comes at a later date. But anyways, uh, with regard to the French cultural legacy, that is one easy graphic example. It's just not as it is advanced nor as, as big of a footprint as, say, the Spanish or the English. The second thing that's worth mentioning is the uh, efforts of a particular trader uh, named, uh, he's a trader, he's a linguist, he's a uh, exposed nerve ending of a human being, and that man's name is René Robert Cavalier Sueur de La Salle. If you're from Texas and if you're watching this video, the good chance is you probably are. Uh, you will notice that there is counties named for LaSalle. There are hotels, and especially in Bryan, Texas. There's a hotel in downtown named the LaSalle Hotel. Anyways, Rene Robert, 
uh, was a upper was a was an elite. Uh, he had studied to become a Catholic uh, priest. Uh, he had studied to become a missionary to China from France. But he and the Jesuits never quite saw eye to eye. And the Jesuits are a division within the Catholic uh, clergy order. Uh, they are a monastic order. And so the, the, the Jesuits or the Society of Jesus rejected him. And so for the rest of Rene Robert's life, he is going to butt heads with the, uh, with the Jesuits. Uh, and it's going to cause him troubles, and he is going to be a maker of his own troubles. And he's the sort of man who brings with him, uh, if he were a bull, he brings his own china shop with him or china closet with him so he can break all the china. And uh, to give you an idea of what type of guy he is personality-wise and how many enemies he makes, the man will be murdered. He will be assassinated uh, in about 1785, no, 1787, 88. Well, anyways, uh, 17, excuse me, 1685, 87 in that neighborhood. And uh, when he's murdered, he is carrying on himself, and he had carried for some time an antidote for poison because some people had tried to poison him. That should tell you a lot about Rene Robert and his life. So, Rene Robert, why do we care? His, uh, is he just because he's a Texas uh, name? Well, no, and yes, and both. Before he comes to Texas, Rene Robert in the 1670s is going to explore the upper Midwest. In fact, in his lifetime, he will travel thousands and thousands of miles that even to this day, many men and women do not travel. He is going to be born in France. He will live for a uh, period of time in Montreal, Canada, and Quebec. Uh, he will travel in and around the upper Midwest claiming territory for France. And that's where, what you probably ought to make note of is his claims. And that's why he's important to us in an American survey class, his claims of land. Uh, in fact, actually, when he gets to claiming land, he will take, uh, with about 20 or 25 uh, traveling companions, they will travel down the length of the Mississippi River, the Ohio River as well, and they will travel down that length and they will uh, pitch a uh, flag, as it were, in the soils there in South Louisiana near the mouth of the Mississippi River. And in about 1683 or so, you can check the date. The particular, the exact particular date is not important to me, but just understand this: in the 1680s, Rene Robert is going to make a claim on the Mississippi River for France, and that is big. It is a gigantic claim, and in fact, if you notice how I'm about to say it, it is uh, should give you an indication about how big that claim is. He, Rene Robert, is going to claim all of the land in the watershed of the Mississippi River for France. And if you think about the Mississippi River, when he says, when I say watershed, or they claim all the tributaries of it, basically all of the creeks and rivers, all of the drews and uh, sloughs and bios are going to, that drain into the Mississippi River are going to be claimed by France as part of New France, this new empire in the Western world. So basically, in a sense, land that runs all the way to the foothills of the Rocky Mountains and the west and all the way eastward to the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains are going to be claimed by France. So in effect, you could argue half of the, the, half of the North American continent, or at least what we would call continental United States, was claimed by the French. That is a massive, massive claim. Is it disputed? Of course it is. The Spanish are not excited, would not be excited about this, and the English uh, will not, not be either. But when time comes, or if you just simply look it up in your textbook, you look at the Louisiana Purchase uh, of the, by the United States in 1803, you can see the outline of that western claim in that, uh, in that land out west. Uh, some politics intervened between the 1680s and 1803, so 120 years is a long enough sweep in time. Uh, but you can still see the outlines of that old remnant claim of LaSalle, and that, in a sense, is what we buy in 1803 from the French. So that's all to his importance. So there's one claim right there at the mouth of the Mississippi River. After making this claim, LaSalle is going to take his coordinates, and he is going to return back to France, and he's going to return back to, uh, excuse me, back to Montreal and then to France. And he's going to ask uh, the king of France, Louis, uh, if he can receive funding for settlement along the, uh, well, it, it depends on who you read, but settlement of a new French colony in this claim somewhere in Louisiana, South Louisiana, somewhere in the near the mouth of the river, set back. Now, some would argue that he 
doesn't really intend to do that. In fact, actually, he's looking to push the claim westward, and that is why Rene Robert, when the, the claimants uh, come back, the settlers come back, uh, in the late 1680s, they're actually going to settle not at Louisiana, but they're going to do it along the coast of Texas at Matagorda and Matagorda Bay. Some of you are familiar with Matagorda because you fished on that bay or gone uh, taken a vacation down there. Matagorda Bay is south and west of Galveston Bay and Galveston Island. It's on the coastal bend of Texas. It is there in the late 1680s that uh, that old uh, La Salle is going to establish Fort St. Louis. And Fort St. Louis is his sticking the flag in the ground, and they're going to try to establish a settlement of Frenchmen there in that land uh, and along the coast of Texas. It, it is not successful. It is ultimately going to be an abject and complete failure. But it is, uh, it is uh, enough, and it's going to be an attempt. And in the meantime, while they are trying to set up shop, and it is a harsh existence, it is very harsh because the land there at Matagorda Bay uh, is of, of a black nature. It's a black land as we call it in Texas. And that black land is harsh and gummy and hard and hard to bust and hard to break. Not to mention you've got hostile Indians, thousands of mosquitoes, alligators, and so forth. The Frenchmen, many of whom were not suited for uh, trailblazing life, are going to be in over their heads and many of them will die. Not to mention the fact that old LaSalle is a harsh man to deal with and somebody you want to punch in the first five minutes, you meet him. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's a killjoy of the first order. And so that contributes to the, the misery of Fort St. Louis. But while the men who are trying to hold on at Fort St. Louis are, are eking out some sort of existence in the six, late 1680s, LaSalle and a couple of traveling companions travel westward ostensibly perhaps to link up with other Frenchmen, is ostensibly to find other lands, it depends on again who you read. But what you do know is, is that La Salle travels as far west as, uh, as the Rio Grande River. And it is here that La Salle is going to put up his second claim. And this is, is a big one too. It is the claim of that all land east of the Mississippi River, all land east of the Mississippi, excuse me, east of the Rio Grande, mark the correction, all land east of the Rio Grande River is hereby claimed for France. If you think about where is the southern boundary of Texas, it is at the Rio Grande River. If you think about and you know your history of Texas, particularly with regard to independence of Texas from Mexico, there was a dispute on where the land of Texas was. Where did it go and where did it start? And it's, it, uh, Texas claimed in 1836 at Independence that the real boundary of Texas started at the Mississippi River, excuse me, started at the Rio Grande River, I'll get it straight eventually, and that is uh, because of the old LaSalle claim. In fact, actually, a few, more than a few men in the, in the 1810s and 20s when the Texas uh, question was out there, and there is filibustering around Texas, there are going to be more than a few men, like, say, Andrew Jackson, a future president of the United States, is going to claim that when the United States bought Louisiana, that because of the French claim of La Salle at the Rio Grande, the United States also bought Texas as well. And so it's part of the political controversy and tapestry. Uh, it is going to be a major thorn in the side of Mexico, Spain, the United States, Texas. It confuses the situation in a sense. Uh, but there are two there are two French com uh, there are two French uh, claims on the land east and, uh, that deals with the Mississippi River in Texas. So they're complementary claims, and that is why Rene Robert and the French uh, element is important to us and important to uh, what is going on in the larger scale. It is worth noting, however, this is also why if you ever see six flags over Texas, one of them is a French flag, it comes from Rene Robert. But ultimately, the French, uh, in the scheme of things, unless you're really just interested in French history and French settlement in North America as a discipline, uh, and a survey class cannot be, the fact is, is that in, of the three great colonizing powers, the French are, in a sense, the weakest of the three and leave perhaps the least uh, cultural impact of the three. The English, obviously, they send many people. The Spanish do what they do, but the French, it is uh, a mixed bag at best but it still has legacy, it's still important, and that concludes this lecture for today.